Um, is there anybody remote? There are, yeah. Okay. Seven people. Okay, then I will try this mic. Is that? All right, I'll just sort of hang out around here then. Awkwardly turn around. Oh, All right, so it's yeah. my pleasure today to introduce uh, Dr. Lonnie Wadani. Um, she's an assistant professor in computer science and neuroscience at Emory University. She got her uh, PhD from UC Santa Cruz. Um, more importantly, we both did time at the University of New Mexico. We didn't overlap, but uh, my advisor ended up following her uh, out to Emory. So that's where she, um, she does research in uh, storage and retrieval access across a wide range of uh, models and application domains. And she's going to talk to us today about data skeletons. So that'll awesome. let's go. <laughs> Thanks, Taylor. So uh, hi, uh, I'm Abni Baldani. Uh, thank you. And I'm here to tell you a little bit about figuring out the core of what's going on in your IO workloads. And so I'll, I'll explain the data skeleton's name in a little bit here. But I'm sure all of you kind of run into this problem of we're designing storage and at least, I know, from the storage designer's perspective, we're focusing on what can we do with these disks? What can we do with this 3D class, class point? And sometimes, I'm sorry, should be this mic a little bit more. Is that uh, can, you uh, can you guys hear all right uh, already with the mic positioned or? It's, it's probably it was right. fine. Yeah. Okay, okay, awesome. Um, so it's often easy to lose track of what we're designing storage for. Um, and that what we're designing for is the end user and their goals are changing, they're changing rapidly, right? So whereas before we had kind of these traditional archives or scientific workloads, now we're designing for areas with very, very high data ingress like genomics or areas where you need to process data really quickly like self-driving cars, where they're generating on the order of 1.5 terabytes an hour and if you do not very quickly process that, like we're talking within about 10 seconds uh, to do a CNN on that data, you crash, literally. And so that's the kind of situation where, you know, storage providers are now kind of on the hook to make sure that we're designing systems that keep modern applications in mind. And unfortunately, right, like while we understand that there's a lot of data out there, we haven't really figured out what the new problems are. And so this is just the, you know, everybody has to have a slide in these talks about how we're making lots and lots of data. So this is my slide about how we're making lots and lots of data. So this is stolen from uh, Rakan Poor. And um, the key thing in the corner there is by 2025, they're projecting, this is an IDC projection, uh, 463 exabytes of generated data a day and this is data that's actually referred to and this doesn't count things like duplicated emails or like checkpoints or other data that's designed to be thrown away this is actual active data so clearly right we're making a lot of data and the usage of that data is changing and by the way this is an informal talk so if at any point you feel like stopping chatting you know snarking please feel free to to stop and ask um, but of that data that we're generating, more and more of it isn't well structured, right? So as storage people, we're pretty good at handling structured data. So if you give me a database, I know exactly how I want to store that database, right? I know what its access pattern is going to be. I know how to design a cache for it. I know what kind of storage to give it. And I can give you a reasonably good idea of how quickly things are going to run, right? But if you notice here, um, that little blue in the, at the bottom of that bar is your structured data and the rest of it is all unstructured, right? So most of the data we don't have these nice parameters for, for how to deal with it. And then, of course, the typical labels that we have for data, like archival, mean very, very little. So this is your traditional archive. Um, so this is Iron Mountain, which is full of tapes. Um, there are right ones, read, read very maybe. Uh, I think there was a recent paper that 50% of these weren't actually readable. Um, but this is your typical archival load, right? Like you write data and maybe it's for compliance reasons, maybe it's for some other you know, reason given to you from on high and you don't expect to ever see it again. 
modern archival data is not like this, right? Um, so this is the snap in my email inbox where most of this data I will never look at again. There is lots of it, but I have not intentionally archived it, right? It's kind of archived by accident. And when I want a piece of that data, I want a piece of that data right now and it had better be there. And this is true of photo albums, right? And so uh, that is uh, the Blu-ray um, storage that Facebook has to store their photos. Uh, so again, most of the Facebook photo storage is archival, but it's archival by accident, right? So these are archives where if, for example, a celebrity dies, people are going to want to see every photo of them ever created, whereas a celebrity lives to a ripe old age, nobody's ever going to care. And so it's really difficult to predict what parts of this data are going to be non-archival ahead of time. Right. And, you know, what people call archival, again, vastly, vastly changes. So this is, uh, we did a meta-analysis to see, you know, people label data archival, what properties that these different data sets had in common. And so in the same year, there were, we collected several traces, and even in the same year, they were very, very different file size. And then across years, right, you had very different file sizes. So there were no traits in that paper that we found that were consistent across types for um, different traits. All right. And then of course, anytime you design storage for a workload, they're gonna change. Workloads are highly dynamic. And again, this is old news to probably everybody in this room. And so these are the couple slides I'm gonna get in trouble for. Um, so HPC data is also changing and um, your typical scientific workloads, right, of doing a lot of data ingress, computation, checkpointing, store data, and then kind of loop is occasionally changing, although I have learned today that MPI will never die. And of course, <laughs> that, is, that is true. There's this, this use case is still there. But we also have other more modern HPC workloads, right, which are, say, maybe you have a Bitcoin mining situation going, or you are uh, have a cluster of CPUs, and you're trying to do a large deep learning workload. And so now all of a sudden you don't have this assumption of sequential and periodic I.O. I, I see questioning eyebrows. Are you good? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes? Okay. Again, stop me. Stop me if you would like to heckle. So this is about where I expect the heckling. And this is actually one thing I really want to hear from you is, you know, what do modern HPC workloads look like and what assumptions can we keep, right? So in the research community, we have this idea that sequential and periodic IO is on its way out. And so we need to kind of redesign how we think about HPC workload provisioning um, on the IO side. And then of course, we need to think about where to put it. Right, so the underlying storage media is also changing. I mean, people have been saying disk is dead for years, people have been saying tape is dead for years, and of course these things are still around, but they are on their way out. So now you're seeing these like enterprise scale flash arrays. Um, and then of course now we have things like 3D Crosspoint, and then, you know, kind of more exotically, so there's, there's Crosspoint in the corner there. Um, we have, you know, DNA-based storage for your long-term archives. We have shingle disks. Um, which give you density, but you trade off the ability to easily do writes. And so again, this is, depends very much, using these new storage media depends very much on understanding your workload very well, because now you have many, many more knobs to turn in how you can place things to maximize density, minimize costs, minimize power, ma maximize performance, whatever you might care about. Oh, I, I yes. have a question about the, the last slide. Please. Um, actually, the one before this. Is that non-sequential non uh, access patterns have kind of been uh, beaten out of a lot of the scientific computing community because they don't work. Right. You're, you're kind of saying, if I understand you correctly, that you see a need for that coming back in. Yeah. So um, if, for example, you are a Bitcoin miner, right? You're not going to get a lot of sequential workload out of that. Sure. So for certain, the, the celebrity photo example or Bitcoin yeah. miner, I get those. Are there, are there scientific computing examples that you can think of that, that are pushing in the direction of non-sequential uh, IO needs? 
So I haven't actually seen the data, but my intuition is that a lot of deep learning workloads are not going to be very sequential. And that's something where I'd love to get a better understanding from people in this room about, you know, is that intuition actually true? But yeah, I'm expecting that if you can't actually reasonably batch your work, if you're trying to wait for a lot of these intermediate results, then it's going to be hard to get that kind of sequential access pattern. Any other thoughts on this? No, yes. Yeah. In general, that's what we're seeing. It's getting more people are doing more IO. Um, just to whether we could, well, I think Glenn, is it Glenn? Yeah. Can we quantify it? <clears throat> Not wait a second. Yeah. <laughs> so, folks are probably right, having the data off of the logs, right? So, yeah, there's at least one intense research project there. Yeah, we should definitely talk then. Um, where was I? I think this is where I was. I was saying that the hardware is changing out from under us. And so even if our workloads were staying the same, which they aren't, we need to kind of revisit how we consider the interface between storage workloads and storage media, right? So we want to know what actually still matters and what we do with it. And we know very little. So we're trying to change this, but if we did know things, right, we could do great things. So this is just a small example of what we could do if we understood our workloads well enough to do good caching. So this was a project where we looked at a workload and we found that it had working sets that were somewhere along the size of like between four and a thousand um, blocks, right? And just by prefetching these working sets into a fingerprint database, we were able to drastically improve the deduplication performance on this computer. And then this is something that um, we've actually implemented now in uh, enterprise um, flash array. What was the workload? It was a research workload. It was a local research workload. I, I don't understand what that means. Um, it was a bunch of students doing experiments. So they made, stuff, they made it up? What? They made it up? No, no, no. It was actually, um, so there was a university and we took all of the student activity on a server. And that was the workload. So it, was, it wasn't a made up, it wasn't a workload that was designed for this project. It was a storage workload that was around the university. Okay, so this would comprise data access and stream of everything. Yeah. And metadata, and metadata they were stuff. playing with their, you know, looking at their email, playing videos, okay. you know, playing Quake on the side. It was all in there. Okay. And then again, so all we could do here, because we could calculate working sets, we could split the new duplication index. I'm not going to go into this one too much because this is mostly here as an illustrative example that if you can understand your workloads, great things will happen. And we actually have some current work now in this doing a multi level uh, cache theory. And so we found already that for a particular workload, um, it's not necessarily going to be hierarchical. So uh, I don't know, I wish I had a slide to show you on this, but uh, at the 11th hour, one of my students uh, gave me the wrong image, but anyways. Um, so we uh, found that we could have situations where you actually want more DRAM, for example, and less SSD and more hard disk again. So you kind of have this pyramid, or this hourglass instead of a pyramid. And so there's some exciting things happening there. But just for this uh, LRU cache, we can get significantly better efficiency if you do this fingerprint grouping. So you're yeah. grouping around, uh, <clears throat> are you sitting around looking at blocks? Yeah, yeah, this was done entirely at the block level. Okay. Um, there's no real reason this can be done at higher levels. Um, so we have another project that uses the exact same technique at the file level. But this particular thing, because we're looking at dedupes, right? Dedupes is at that 1K on size. So. All right, so our grand, plan, our grand plan to quantify this is something that we're calling Skeletor. And so we're looking again for kind of the bones of your data, right? We'd like to understand, you know, apart from these old labels that we have of like archival or enterprise, you know, what's really going on between data sets and maybe things that are more similar across these different areas than they are within these areas. So I'm going to briefly talk about some work we're doing in metric identification, and then I'll focus more on what we're doing with the actual extraction. So 
Um, we have one project where we're actually trying to understand what features are happening without understanding anything at all about the data. So this is um, also at the block, yes, this is at the block level, um, where we're trying to just understand what higher dimensional features exist between different data sets. Could you tell us what the axes and the colors are? So these are just, um, they're actually the same as here, right? Um, they're space and time. So you have some sort of spatial dimension, um, in this case, LBA, and then time dimension. And then similarly here, right? So in this case, we're seeking the entire, in this case, um, we had features that were extracted. So you're looking here at the hidden layers of uh, CNN. Whereas here, you're looking at the entire trait. And the time scale, is it, that's over seconds or hours? No, this so this these are entire trees. So um, each image is about a week, I think, on these. So. And the the color, the frequency of axes. Yes. Yeah. Um, and so just even looking at these, right, you can tell that there's some correlations between things that have acted similarly on our system. And so uh, we're clustering these and doing some other work to um, try to figure out what, again, what visual features are important. Um, and so there is a privacy dimension to this that is future work for us right now, where we can actually look at these and figure out what applications are running in some cases. So a database, for example, like a nice diagonal line right up. And you know you can actually find the journal pretty easily. I think you can see this just on the right there. And so there are a couple patterns that you could just pull out, like you know, that ring is NTFS. So this is measured on the server side, right? Yes. Yeah, this is all done on the server side. So this is the problem we have doing this here is that we have three or four hundred people doing a mixture of all these things at the same time. Mm -hmm. So so, and that the Fourier transform kind of thing we never really figured out where you would break it down into components of what each person is doing. Yeah, so that's actually something I'll be talking about in a few slides. That, that's something that we ran into as a problem also. So um, this was a single client, and then we actually had multiple data sets from the same sort of place. And so we combined them together and then re-separating them out to figure out what was going on at a you know client level it was very hard. So again, we're trying to find good metrics, right? So we took a look at what metrics were standard, and this is again a meta-analysis where we pulled um, just, okay, what do people look at? And they did not at all match the things that we found were important. So um, we hit that problem of figuring out tenancy. And we ended up first needing to figure out how many tenants were even in our system, right? So um, the technique that we needed, we were like, okay, we have two or we have 300, we don't know. So let's see if we can figure that out automatically. And again, people, please stop me if there's anything where I'm blowing by something. Um, you've been very quiet. So the, the previous slide was going back. This is incidents here is how often? Or right, this was literally, um, we looked at every single paper that did a workload analysis that we could get our hands on. And we um, just, you know, made a histogram of the times that these features were used. Okay. And they, that they were used to? They were, they were used within the classification that the um, paper was focused on. Okay. And, and what is the backing file system, remind me? This is file system agnostic. Okay. So this was um, across several different IO traces from different file systems. So they kind of, so year, what is year exactly? Like? Year the trace was collected. Okay. Again? The year the trace was collected. So, so what this is showing is what the what the analysis are using as their measurement. So everybody's using year. Yeah, how does yeah. everybody use using system size? As a, as a yes. So you analyzed seventeen papers. Um no, so uh, there were I think thirty something. So it wasn't everybody was using year. And the next slide is showing. Right. Uh, so what this was what was actually affected according to your metric. 
Right, right. So for the results that we wanted, we were curious to see, again, how many tenants were in our system. And so we did a time series analysis um, without any prior bias about what features might be important. And this is what we ended up coming out with. So the address complexity uh, mattered quite a bit more than anything else that we looked at. And that is very strongly tied to um, the spatial locality of the data set. So, so what, so. what is address complexity? Yeah, um, so this is, these are time series analysis features. And so it is a function of the spatial locality. And I can uh, okay. get so into what- different locations are being accessed simultaneously? Um, it's the uh, proximity, it's, it's a ratio of proximity between locations. And that, so not circular, how much you're skipping around, right? What? How much you're skipping around. Yeah. Yeah. It's on, like, you said the address complexity is a function of temporal locality, but then you're using so it. Spa uh, spatial. spatial. Okay. So, what um, uh -huh. what are you trying to predict? So we're trying to, and I, I'll go into that on a couple slides here, but um, the, this feature analysis was to predict the number of tenants that were within our workload trace. Okay. okay. Um, of course, this ended up being very reliant on which trace we were using. So um, this is many of the same features, and as we changed the trace that we were looking at, the feature importance varied wildly. So even for a very simple problem like this, finding a core set of metrics is a complex open problem, right? And so, yeah. Why are you plotting that? Uh, in the bottom one? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so this is um, relevance of the, so the features that are on that rainbow plot. It's a uh, relevance per trace. Oh, okay. So the three different traces. Right. And uh, light is good. Okay. So I, I apologize for the lack of axes, but it got really, really messy very quickly. So just wanted to quickly show that they were different. Yeah. The goal there. You said light, light is Light is good. Better, better. Yes. Oh, yeah. And so, I mean, I guess the, the takeaway there is that you need some automated system to analyze the best features. Of yeah, you need, and that there's no consistent set of features that we found so far. So this isn't, you know, often, right, especially early on in this project, we got a lot of feedback of, we know what features to use, right? They're the same features we've always been using. Um, but we kind of want to show that this is actually an interesting open problem because the features are highly dependent on the workload. And I should point out, right, like workloads don't exist independent of their infrastructure. So two people could be running the exact same thing. And if one person has twice the cache or the other, they're gonna look very different in this post cache IO workload. And so if you don't have that sort of metadata, right, you can't necessarily say that these situations are gonna be the same metrics, the same layout, the same handling in any way. And so, you know, one thing I'm really interested in is how do you tease out the function from the infrastructure, right? How do you figure out what somebody is doing as an outside observer if you don't necessarily have that CPU information, if you don't necessarily know how often they block on other tenants, if you don't know how much cash they were going through? So yeah. Is, I think part, part of the, the, the problem there is, is the, um, well, let me ask this. Have, have, do you have data sets of, of known tenancy? Yes. Okay. And so have you tried deconvolving that out? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So that, that's coming. Okay. Yes. Okay. Sorry. No, no, no. It's fine. I'm, I jumped a little because I wanted to show that the metric extraction problem was hard. But I, I maybe should have uh, started telling you more about this project before. Yeah. Other, other questions? All right. So. Um, yeah, so it's problematic if you don't have any ground truth. I completely agree, right? And so as a result, we want to use as few metrics as possible. And of course, we, if you want to functionally separate workloads, we can't define our classes as a combination of metrics. So our goal is to minimize metric redundancy and maximize metric coverage. And so that, that's going to right back in that. I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. 
If we wanted to introduce instrumentation, uh -huh. we, if we wanted to introduce instrumentation to do to do a study of our workload, what would we need? What would we what would we be collecting? At minimum, block IO. That, or, that's like just numbers of blocks written written over time, or do you want right, to like, arrival times? Right? Some, I mean, at minimum, right? Some sort of locality and some sort of time parameter. Right. And. Then you get the questions of sampling, and that's actually very hard, right? Because if you want to do sampling for a lot of these um, sort of like burstiness or cyclic questions or figuring out um, what the phase shifts are in your workload, right? Like that's, there's no good standard I know of on how to do that. Um, so in an ideal world, you collect everything, um, but of course that gets to be its own storage problem very quickly. And so then there's, you know, some sort of compromise and how much you would collect. But yeah, I mean, more is better, right? Like, so if you could tell us, you know, UID, whatever, right? Or any sort of maybe if it's pre or post cash or what have you, right? so, We'll take yeah, more. This is a long conversation, but we have all the data mm -hmm. in principle and many databases that, well, limited versions, but in many places, in many logs where the timestamps Anyway, you get the idea, right? It's, it's a, it goes yeah. back to almost your second slide, right? If we have a lot of data, it's all messy. How you combine it, as you do something intelligible with this information. Yeah, and I mean, it's not an easy problem, right? It's like knowing what you want, knowing you know how to align things. Um, so I didn't talk about it, but one thing that we tried to do at Point was collect data at different levels of the stack and try to align it. And that was really hard. We were surprised at how many times, you know, we what we thought had been collected had actually not actually been collected so there are dropped accesses of that or dropped um logs at the file system level but we can see at the block level things happen right and then we see this up at the application level and then back down and things are offset and so it's also not an easy problem data is dirty yeah ground ground truth for io is like an order of magnitude harder than for them i would believe that I mean, the right answer in multiple levels, like you said. Yeah, yeah, right. Like it's it's all about where you're collecting it and what frame I think you're looking at it. I mean, so yeah. we have a lot of places we where we've been introducing instrumentation. Mm. So that you know, if there's things that we we could collect that we're not collecting, that would be good. You know, that would be good to know. If there's yeah. stuff we could throw away that is no value, that's also another. Yeah, you know, that's also not that's also useful for us. We we should talk about this because I mean I have I have biases I guess I can uh, propagate to you, um, but honestly because there is so little IO data out there I think most of the community has kind of learned to live with IO data just like block IO data. Um, there's even um, a group working with like single snapshots, so right you get like one um, snapshot with lots of metadata but it's like one time point per week, and you can do a surprising amount with even that. So I think it depends on what question you're trying to answer. So we can talk about that. Yeah, we have really a lot of data. Only having the public is actually a whole other problem. Of, of course. Yeah. Other questions? All right, let me let me jump ahead to talking about these interleaved workloads, this multi-tenancy situation, um, right? So what we can do when we have ground truth is do this deconvolution. And say this is using ICA. Um, so at the top is our mixed signal, and then we are true sources, and we do pretty well, right? It's not fantastic. I could do better, but even with simple ICA on this um, mixed workload, we can get reasonably good mean squared error. And um, the problem with that, so this is five workloads over 10 minutes. The problem is that we don't always know how many workloads we have. In fact, we never know how many workloads we have. So even if you tell me that five people are using the system, you haven't told me that five people are using the system differently. And the goal here isn't to figure out how many people are there. The goal is to figure out how many things are going on, how many different use cases are happening, right? So if you have a hundred different clients, but you only have two real workloads going on, I don't want to design a hundred different subsystems when I could design two. Uh, it's not as simple as that though, because uh, interaction of A with A and A with B uh, means that 
you don't actually need many different original patterns in order to end up with a much larger combinatorial number of combinations of patterns that hit the back end. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. And um, one thing that we're still trying to figure out is that once we tease these people apart, right, what is the right way to reallocate? you know, our, what our resources, are they, should, we sep should we separate them or should we allow them to be in the same space? Yeah, so we have data on that too. Uh, <laughs> we, have the, we have the front end logs, so we have to okay. show which instruments the IO pattern output uses. We have the back end logs. The thing we've never done is figure out the correlation between them. The other thing that's the problem is that's not everything that's touching the file system. There's people editing source code or info files or whatever and mm -hmm. interacting with two people moving data in and out of the center and all these kind of things. So we had a dream to instrument everything everywhere. We're getting there though. <laughs> That's fascinating, right? Like it would be fantastic to actually see this correlation, like you say, because it's not an obvious question to answer, right? Like what do you do once you have these people separated out? Like what is the well, right right. So we had this conversation over the years, right? The logical extreme is to give everybody their own file system. Right. Then they're all happy, some version of happy, but the performance all sucks, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, clearly that's not the right answer either, but what's the thing in between, right? So that's one of the things we've been talking about, the future direction is how do we go from, how do we guarantee a quality of service to somebody who mm -hmm. really needs it, maybe charge them a lot more than someone that doesn't. Right. Uh, and the first step of that is how we would even uh, be able to communicate to the file system that this person is more important. Or maybe we're just giving their own one, I don't know. I mean, you can imagine, right? Like, if you have two real sets of clients, you could make them give them two file systems, right? If you can find some sort of clustering or grouping across your tenant space. Yeah, so we could pretty easily, you know, say all these, you, this group of users never create a file larger than a kilobyte, so we'll put mm -hmm. all of them on the flash, and that these group of users only makes files terabytes, we'll put them all over there. Actually, that doesn't work because, uh, well, that's naive, right? It's the, the, the users never fall uh, nicely into these categories that you can make up. Of. Right, no, exactly. And it's, it's tricky, and they, of course, their workflows do change very quickly. Right, like we've noticed that phase shifts tend to happen between every 10 and 30 minutes. Um, the phases don't shift that much. So we have like a model workload space now. So instead of having these like labels, we have essentially um, different um, axes within our feature space. And so you take whatever basis you're closest to and you say, okay, this workload is kind of falls under this basis, right? Um, you look, are you questioning or? Um, this Focusing too much on particular words, your, your description suggests that there's like a linear. Yeah, so I mean that that's a way to think about it. Um, we're not strictly, obviously, create you know, creating a matrix for each uh, workload, but that would be ideal if we could. Um, so you can imagine it's a similar thing. Like you take this n-dimensional space and you have a feature array that represents each workload, right? And so the model workloads really are the bases of that space now. Like they really are the, you know, your, your directions. We've had a handful of cases where you could go back and look at data and identify one particular user that was really, really swamping one particular aspect of the system. Uh -huh. And it, you know, it kind of, right now there's no, there's no systematic good way of doing it. Right. You can go in, look at the traces, maybe make the plots, and notice that this one particular person is doing it. So the extent that we can get tooling, tooling and, and even approaches to go and do that, that would, that would have a that will have an impact operationally for a lot of the, the you know, pathological workflows hmm. that we're seeing. Um, you know, somebody opening a few million, I forget what it was, like ten thousand files per second at one point on a very small job wound up saturated. You know, so we've had a lot of cases like that. You're reading backwards too much. Oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking of a lot of things that, that would be very annoying for. <laughs> we, we've had a lot, there's a lot of who, who are the heavy users um, mm. kinds of things that, we, um, that yeah, I've, been, I've been very interested in because we have data on the back half so that drive that back to whoever is running it. It's pretty tricky. And so, if there's any way to like even predict based on their initial behavior and setup what they're going to be doing. 
Yeah. Like what, well, what class you're going to fall into. And operationally, it's sort of, you know, who's crashing this thing. Right. right. That, that comes up, that comes up pretty well. I, yeah, seems important. <laughs> um, so just quickly, so this is um, the architecture of the experiment that created that rainbow graph earlier, where we were trying to figure out, again, how many tenants that we have. So um, we're, again, we're taking our AO trace, we're splitting it up into features using this time series analysis. And then, um, just uh, showing you at the screen. So for each um, workload we looked at, and sorry, Anon here is um, the Emory IO data set from earlier. This was the submitted to something double blind, so we never changed that around. Um, we saw that with um, the time series analysis, we can actually do fairly well for detecting the number of tenants we had, and we have ground truth here. So we um, artificially designed um, different use cases for ours, and then we actually talked with people who made the data sets in the other cases. So we know exactly what was going on in each of these systems and how many different functional users we had. And so we have relatively high confidence in the um, detection in this case. So what's the the solid versus slash. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so solid is baseline, and um, slash is us. Upper is better. Um, so the um, access lack of percent accuracy. And um, here, uh, one approximate and two approximate means that. Um, so say that you had five clients. One approximate gives you credit for four or six. Two approximate gives you credit for three or uh, seven. So now we can figure out how many clients we have. Now we actually have a shot of doing this interlude workload separation. And uh, we're looking for more data sets now to try that out on. We're doing well on the data sets we have, but obviously our data sets aren't representative. Do you, I mean, are you interested? Or how, how do you think, I like guessing five clients, I imagine is different if you were trying to guess, you know, do I have 2,000 or what? The, I, you know, scale, you I would love to see how this scales. I think it should, but we do not have any data sets that don't have that many different functional clients in them. And even if we took every data set we had and combine it together, I don't think we'd hit over 10. Are you talking about the size of the parameters, the, 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 the parameter space or this? No. How many active tenants? Yeah, so here, right, we're classifying to find out how many active, <laughs> um, functionally distinct tenants there are. Well, in, in that, that direction, you know, it seems like from a workload classification perspective, mm. tenancy, you know, could also be just a categorical access for workload determinative things. Yeah, right? no, that's and, exactly what I'm talking yeah, about, right? Okay, in, in which case the, the parameters or the features, I think it is to call them, you know, could, could also be uh, in, in that space. Yes. Um, so that's actually a worry of ours, right? Because we don't want to train our testing set. Um, and we're doing a feature analysis before we do this. Oh, but a little bit different. I'm saying that you could use histograms for your, your features mm. rather than uh, you know, the kind of uh, IO chart that's called as you're showing. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah that could work. Um, I think that, that that would certainly work for some. Some of these types, but I think some of the it just makes the notion of tenancy very, very yeah, yeah. No, I mean when I say tenant, right? I'm talking about a functionally distinct usage of the system, right? So, like you know, classically, just the person who comes in and like reads data diurnally, right? Like that would be a tenant, regardless of how many different people are doing that, or how many different workloads are doing that, or even if you do, you do that sometimes, right? Like so, one user can be five different tenants in this case. But you know, it's exactly, it's, it's defined by features. All right. And so again, um, now we figure out how to measure, right? So we figured out, how am I doing on time, by the way? Yeah. Um, yeah, we have uh, about 15, 20 minutes. All right. Um, so I might uh, gun through this a little bit quickly because I would like to talk about, well, actually, no, this is the end, isn't it? Ah, I took those out already. Good job. Um, so for figuring out how to measure again, right, we need to figure out where to instrument the questions that we have. And 
then kind of what to do with the data at different levels. So everything I talked about has been either the block or the file level, right? Obviously at the object level, there are going to be some things that we can keep and some things that we need to change. And then aligning what we've learned in lower levels with these upper levels um, is an open question, right? Um, so we're using Intel DSS to propagate information up the stack right now. And ideally we can do better. So kind of from here, right? We're trying to figure out like how our two workloads meaningfully different. That's a core question we're trying to answer is what does it mean for a workload to be similar to another workload or not? And then from there, we'd like to separate out functional types and then finally be able to tell you what hardware to buy based on the workload you have. Um, which of course is gonna make lots and lots of good things happen. We're looking at improving power. Um, let's say we have projects open in caching right now um, in performance and uh, make all, all the things better. And so with that, I can take some questions if uh, you've saved any for the end. Not